Okay, hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Default Global. This is where we connect with global first entrepreneurs and remote work experts from all around the world. And our guest today is Gary Walker, remote and hybrid work specialist. Gary, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much for inviting me along, Peter. Thanks. Absolutely. Gary, you have worked with big names like Microsoft, like Electronic Arts, helping them in in adopting remote and hybrid work practices, right? So with that, we would love to hear more about your background. Could you could you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your journey in the remote work field? Yeah, sure. I am be happy to. Um, so my name is Gary Walker. I work as a consultant at 22 North. Um, my kind of remote journey started back in 2006, which was a long time ago, where I'd kind of uh, started my own company to uh, build out web content. Um, I used to do dev work and uh, design work. So back then I couldn't afford an office when I was starting my own business. And um, I thought, well, I'll just I'll do it from home, we'll do it remotely. Um, it was a lot more challenging back then because you didn't really have the tools. The technology wasn't as advanced mm -hmm. as it should have been. So I quickly realized that wasn't going to be sustainable. Therefore, I decided to go back in to work permanently in an organization. Um, from there, I always knew like I, I really enjoyed remote work and I enjoyed the fact that I could have deep focus time and I could really I could focus on something through to completion without all the stereotypical interruptions that happen in, a, in an office space. Mm -hmm. But moving back into an enterprise company, that was obviously going to be very difficult because it was a full uh, seven and a half thousand people with another five thousand offshore um, folks that were contractors. Mm -hmm. It was all office based. Um, so around about 2013, um, I used to head up innovation at, at Three, um, which is a telecommunications company, which they have okay. subsidiaries across um, the globe. Um, and one of the tasks I was asked to look at was, our, um, could we start to build uh, internal digital products for Three that we could potentially white label or influence our ways of working? So that was my moment of, right, this is my chance to let's go remote with this. So. Um, I had to seek air support, which typically you need to do from the execs. So mm -hmm. I had two guys, um, John and, and Joe, who worked at Three, and they were both really supportive. They would give me the autonomy. Um, and I just said to them, look, I wanna, I'm want i going to need to bring in developers. I'm going to need to bring in uh, a kind of hybrid UX or product owner, um, and I want to do it remotely. This had never been done in the organization before. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to go and figure out pretty much how we we're going to do that, how we we're going to recruit people, how we we're going to build the right practices, rituals, even just the tooling as well, and making sure we had the tools to support. Um, and then also interfacing back with a what I would call an incumbent enterprise business. It was all in office and they were very uh, stringent on security and all these policies. So it was an amazing experience. And during that period of three to four years, I was able to build out fully distributed um, teams mm -hmm. um, we had to do them in some unorthodox ways like like some of the hiring platforms that i use were twitter <laughs> back in mm -hmm. 2013 and 14. Mm -hmm. um, but then also tooling was really interesting because i was very clear on what are the jobs to be done what are the, the outcomes we want to achieve um, and how do we get the right tools in place and those weren't the tools that the organization used so there was a lot of bureaucracy and politics to navigate yeah. to be able to do that. So this was all really formative experience um, for me. Um, my passion for remote work wasn't by that point had changed to more of a family oriented mm -hmm. goal. I, my daughter was born in 2011 and then my role kind of required me to just travel constantly. So um, I went a little bit rogue. I kind of pushed the boundaries and then started to show the value of the work for myself and also my teams. Um, but yeah, I was able to build out and nurture the first of our uh, globally distributed teams at three. And then the turning point for me, which then led me into consultancy, was that the business then came to us. So for the first couple of years, they were asking, why are you doing what you're doing? You shouldn't be doing what you're doing. And then the question changed to, how are you doing what you're doing? Um, and when they asked how, that was a really powerful moment because then we could then start to interact with that business right. and not only become a development team that were building products and ways of working, but then consulting back into the business to really help them on how do they communicate, collaborate more effectively? How do they look at the tools that are right tools? 
and how do we control the experience, that digital employee experience? And ultimately our goal was how do we make it easy for people to find the information and tools that they need to do their job? That was really the mantra that we went with. Um, and that was just an amazing experience. Um, and that then led me to eventually deciding to leave the company and start my own business back in, in 2017, 18. Um, and that was with the ambition of going and trying to help other organizations see the benefits of, of globally distributed teams mm -hmm. overcome some of the challenges as well so um, my friend matthew and i we wrote a book uh, back in 2018 called ready, ready for, for remote, remote yeah mm -hmm. and um, it was really just a playbook which as you know things we always say look at your ways of working like a product it should be constantly mm -hmm. evolving so i look back now and i'm like oh my god i've, I've changed so much like from some of those principles but the fundamental things that are in place for that um, and then pre-pandemic, it was really challenging trying to be a consultant and still uh, the, the type of work I wanted to do wasn't just providing guidance for people. It was actually, mm -hmm. for want of a better word, getting my hands dirty. So actually doing the playbooks, the guidance, the adoption, because I think that's really important not to just be theory based, but also actually constantly be uh, evolving the way that you are working and, and learning those practices. Um, mm -hmm. So pre-pandemic, it was very challenging because you really mm -hmm. needed enlightened leaders and it was mostly startups that, that were looking at that lens. And then post pandemic, it's changed to where we are now, which is a lot of large enterprise companies are kind of throwing tools and technology at the problem to try and get through that period. And now they're starting to see what we need to, to build a sustainable way to, to, to work globally. So that's a whirlwind tour of, of the last kind of <laughs> 17 or 16 years. So yeah. Okay. Okay, sounds good. And talking about your book, Ready for Remote, right? So can you share briefly maybe some some of the best practices and principles of building and nurturing remote teams that you discuss in your book, right? So particularly uh, in the context maybe of global hiring and managing teams across various countries and time zones, maybe continents. Sure. Um, so I think one of the, the constants that's never changed from... 2014 when we were building these teams out to the book was the three fundamental principles that, that we spoke about in that book mm -hmm. back then um, number one being trust which is really no surprise to anyone who, who works remotely without trust remote work doesn't work so giving people um, and companies the ability to see what does that actually look like and what does that mm -hmm. mean so you've you've ultimately got to trust your people to do the work that they're going to right. do and um, you've got to trust your people that and give them the autonomy to figure out the problems but you as a leader also need to put in the right practices and processes to allow those people to be transparent with their work so that they're not inviting questions about what they're doing it's very clear to the team and to the company and organization of these are the outcomes and the goals that you're wanting to work towards and here's the indicators that show the progress of that work these types of things are very important. And I think the other element of trust that's not spoken about a lot is then making sure you have the right security security protocols in place mm -hmm. in terms of identity, security of your data, which can be challenging. But I think if you can get that right, it, it, it makes zero difference to whether someone's in an office or remote. Um, so that's principle one. Principle two is clarity. Um, and what we mean by clarity is just literally making sure your team is highly aligned and they have mm -hmm. high autonomy. So it's very clear the outcomes that they're working towards, the tasks that they're working towards, mm -hmm. but also they have the autonomy to go and figure out the problems. Because one of the things we've, from a hiring perspective, like I'm not a huge fan of Steve Jobs, but obviously there's that famous quote, you don't hire um, smart people and tell them what to do. But right. in, that, in that context, what we used to apply was smart people want to, they want to work on really difficult things. They want to like solve mm -hmm. problems. So. You don't want to tell them how to solve that problem. You want to just give them the guidance of what we're working towards and then allow them to do that. I think right. that keeps them engaged a lot longer because you're moving them into a space where they're constantly being challenged and they're constantly getting to solve mm -hmm. problems. Um, whereas if you're just telling them, you might still give them high alignment, but you're telling them how to figure that out. You might only get a smaller um, duration or tenure from that person because they want to go and be challenged. So, And then the final one is... This is only one that's kind of changed the terminology. We used to call it transparency. I've kind of mm -hmm. changed it to visibility now. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is just showing yeah, your work as a, a byproduct of your work. So that's not to be confused with having the green dot on and being visible online. 
it's more about the actual work that you're doing and making sure you're creating visibility and transparency of that work. So those are the three fundamental principles that, that haven't changed. And I think those are the ones that if you can build those out, then you will be on the right path to, to being successful with a remote organization. Yeah. And speaking about trust, uh, you also discussed this uh, in your book, right? And you, you, you discussed the importance of trust in a remote work environment. So how can entrepreneurs, executives establish and, and maintain trust within their globally distributed teams? How is it possible? Maybe there are some practical tips that you can uh, give us. Yeah. So I think you, you need to assume trust, like obviously with any relationship, trust is built over time, but you have to start from the position of trusting individuals to complete their work and do their work. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, when you're remote, as you know, like you're, it's not about visibility that you're in the office, it's about productivity and output. There's no hiding place when it comes to remote, it exposes things a lot clearer, clearly. So by making sure you're highly aligning the work that you're doing and making sure people clearly understand the outcomes they're working towards, it's relatively simple. You're measuring them on, on output and productivity. Mm -hmm. And if someone's not completed something, either one of two things have happened. You've not clearly uh, aligned or, or outlined the, the outcome, or per perhaps you just have the wrong person. Um, and then the security aspect is something that should just give you that extra confidence. Because obviously a lot of people then wonder about identity is this the person that they're saying they are um, in terms of the codes, in terms of the security of the actual data as well. But these are all protocols and, and uh, solutions that you can put in place just to give you that added layer of, of trust. But for mm -hmm. me, it comes from, as a leader, I, I trust my people. I've gone through the process of hiring them. So I start from that position. Um, mm -hmm. I think that I think it's relatively simple. If you don't do that, you're just you're not going to be successful, and people are not going to want to work for the organization. So, right, right, and uh, you touched this a bit in terms of productivity, right? In in one of your blog posts, I guess it's uh, the myth of remote working. You address this myth that remote workers are less productive, right? So, and I'm just wondering how can organizations ensure that their remote employees maintain a high level of productivity and engagement, right? While they're just in different time zones, in different countries. Yeah. So the way I've kind of always looked at it is, is measuring on output. Um, so I necessarily, when I've worked with my teams, and obviously it will vary on the, the nature of the work you're doing, but if we use, for example, a development team, mm -hmm. and they maybe have a product owner or something along those lines, it's quite clear uh, during your sprint or during your, your period of work, you set yeah. clear goals and outcomes of what you're working towards. What I used to say to the team was there are certain periods where we want to come together to not give status updates, but talk about maybe some of the barriers or, or solutions that we need to solve. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, what I say to them is that I don't necessarily care when that work is completed. You do your work when you're at your best to do your work. It's at the end of the week or at the end of the sprint, we're going to right. be able to have that visibility of has that outcome been achieved. And that's where that productivity lends. But also, some teams like in the past have been care, like almost compared apples for apples. Like I've seen in office teams and remote teams almost be structured in the same way. And you just see a, not only like a, a more productive um, team when you look at remote, I think mm -hmm. the work-life balance is better. And also there's fewer errors um, because there's fewer interruptions. Um, mm -hmm. And so the quality of the work and the quality of the code and these different things is a higher standard. So these are just some of the things that, that I've experienced um, during my time. Um, and they can all be measured as well. Like obviously if you're utilizing uh, tools where you're, you're uh, looking at um, your, your code has been pushed when you're looking at your task management, all these different aspects, you can mm -hmm. measure that too. Um, so yeah, for me, it's like that then allows people to shape their life around their work and not the other way. And they can focus on the tasks that they need to do. Um, people might ask about the question about time, like what if someone completes their tasks in five hours versus someone in seven, but ultimately like you're wanting people to deliver their work, like the outcome, it's the outcome. That's all that matters to me is like, as the outcome that we set being completed. So, um, so, yeah. Yeah, and also in this in the same blog post, I guess you 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 touch this. You mentioned that remote uh, remote working can be lonely, right, for some employees. And how companies who are kind of new to this remote work 
policy, right? Uh, how they can build this, uh, maybe create uh, a sense of community and connection among globally distributed teams, right? To mitigate yeah. these feelings of loneliness and isolation, maybe? Yeah. And I think this is something that it's worth mentioning that during the pandemic, it really got amplified. I think mm -hmm. a lot of people who hadn't experienced remote work kind of started to sense this is really not for me, not realizing it wasn't a true reflection of remote work because right. everything was locked down. So that was a difficult um, education to give people that this isn't a true reflection of remote work. When you do have a true reflection, then you're not restricted <clears throat> in terms of where you want to go. Um, and then the other aspect is my, one of my old colleagues, Megan, used to say home is not a sanctuary for everyone. So that's a really important thing to consider too. Mm -hmm. When it comes to community, I think there's a couple of different things. There's the virtual aspect, and then there's the local communities um, and the in-person aspect as well. So I think one of the important things is invest in in-person where you can. Now, that's not always possible. It's going to be very dependent on your budget, your funds. But certainly what we've seen is when you have a globally distributed team, maybe if you can bring them together once a year, if that's possible, twice, the more frequently you can do that, the better. I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to do it more than probably once a quarter, to be honest. Um, but bringing those people together, really just to connect, like that's so important. Not to come together to work per se. I think um, the way we used to do it uh, previously and the teams that I've built is we'll come together and we'll probably have some social activities that we'll do, but we'll also maybe have like something like a wee hackathon that we want to try and work together to solve something that's completely yeah. irrelevant. But that's really, really powerful in this sort of building connection. And um, I think from a virtual perspective, making sure you've got the right channels and your collaboration or whatever platform you're using to mm -hmm. facilitate your communication. So mm -hmm. making sure you've got the right naming conventions so that people don't get overwhelmed with channels, but having social channels for your stereotypical things like book clubs, film clubs. I think one thing though that I haven't seen a lot is in the pre-boarding process is really capturing people's social interests, what they're really passionate about outside of outside of work, and then enabling a connection with people inside the organization that share those and building community around that. I think that's really difficult to solve at the minute. Um, a lot of teams uh, typically will have a channel for like locations and stuff, and that's maybe how they solve it but then the onus is on that person to go and find that channel so if it's like edinburgh location edinburgh or location glasgow like there's no process for me to other than stumble across that and um, but also there's no real purpose behind that other than oh well, yeah that's great i'm talking to someone in edinburgh and glasgow i think organizations should try and facilitate like whether it's trying out local restaurants that have just opened up so because mm -hmm. a big thing i'm passionate about is how you rejuvenate local communities through remote work um, but also impact on a social change. So obviously a lot of organizations have the mission to positively impact social like, uh, and economic um, aspects mm -hmm. of work. So I think what's interesting is you can facilitate that too. So by capturing so people's social interests and aligning with the mission, you can maybe create tribes or communities that can come together and do these types of things. People often use volunteer days and things like that. But I think you can make that a lot more meaningful um, I think that's definitely important. And then offer on just other aspects to, to connect. So again, virtually, a lot of people use things like different tools to bring people together. But I love the idea of just things like unconference. I don't know if you heard of the idea of unconference, but mm -hmm. yeah. So but doing it in a virtual setting, like I've done that quite a few times and people rock up and you just learn things about people that you just wouldn't ever imagine is an interest of theirs. And it just, again, sparks that connection. It sparks that conversation. Um, and what I've seen over time is like I'm far more connected, far more connected with people I work remotely than I have been in an office um, over okay. time. So, yeah, I think those are some of the things to consider. Definitely the virtual elements, investing in in-person where you can. But I think the real golden nugget at the moment is like how do you facilitate communities that can connect virtually but also can connect in person that are tackling things like rejuvenating their own local community connecting people outside of the organization as well um, mm -hmm. i think that's quite a fascinating um, aspect too so yeah and speaking about digital tools and platforms right so for example in my case i have teams in like a 10 plus countries right so i really have to rely on those digital tools to communicate to you know to just uh 
to, to be in touch with my current team. So with that, with your experience, can you share maybe some insights or on selecting and maybe implementing the right digital tools to support your team, to support their this remote work, um, this communication, you know, with your productivity probably, with yeah. your globally distributed team? Yeah, and it's, this is always the one. It's a great question because it's always the one that comes up. Like lots of people are, they've always got an obsession with tools and technology when it comes to remote work. And um, I kind of, I've got a strange stance in this where it's the tool is not the goal for me. And I always try and say that as often as I can. Like, what are the jobs mm-hmm. to be done? So, Clay Christensen's theory that he uses in the Innovator's Dilemma book back in the early two thousands. I love the consideration of just breaking down what are the jobs to be done for this team to be successful? What are the things that they need to access? And how do we mm-hmm. make it a frictionless experience to access that information? From there, you can start to think about what are the right tools for you. Now, those will vary depending on existing tools that you maybe have in your organization. If you are an enterprise, if you're a startup, you have more of an advantage because you can look at green fields. But also, I think what's important is people aren't tactical when they do this. So they don't just go and look at, right, we need task management tool let's procure one. I think we need to consider that end-to-end digital employee experience and really map Mm -hmm. that out. And then also think about how are these tools integrating and talking to each other? Because that's going to be really important in terms of you want a single source of the truth for your information and your policies and guidance. A a lot of people don't consider that when they start out. And then what typically happens is a lot of people end up with far too many tools. A lot of them don't talk to each other. Or in the enterprise case, a lot of legacy tools. so yeah, I think mapping out the jobs to be done, what are the tasks that have to be achieved? How do you want to facilitate communication and collaboration? And what are the technical tools that you need in place? And then mapping that out as an end-to-end experience and then looking at obviously considering price, considering security, considering, I suppose, usability and, and how mm-hmm. intuitive the tools are, but also looking at a broader, what is the vision for your organization? Where do you want to go? If you don't want to invest in a toolkit or a tool set that's tactical and it's not sustainable, you don't want to have to constantly rebuild that out um, in terms of the actual infrastructure. So these are all really important factors um, when it comes to selecting tools. Um, I think what you should also do is try where possible to have a default tool for your different categories. Now, you don't need to have just one singular tool, but for communication, collaboration, files, meetings, um, all these different things, you should try and where possible select a default tool also offer up an alternative or even something that can enhance enhance one of those tools. Obviously, with Slack, there's tons and tons of mm-hmm. enhancements. Even Microsoft Teams now has over like 750 um, apps and stuff like that. So, um, And these can just make people more efficient and effective. So there's that aspect. Um, I'm passionate about this topic, so there's two other things I'd love to like raise. Like One is... Again, it's difficult unless you don't have the people, but I do think it's important to invest in this. Have a team that's responsible for your digital tools, your infrastructure. Um, And a lot of people will say IT, but what I mean by this is not only a team that are looking at identifying what the tools are and mapping them out and making sure people have easy access to them Mm -hmm. and they they use SSO and pass through authentication and, and connect to your Active Directory to allow that to happen. But also that team is responsible for when someone wants to procure a new, t- new tool, they need to engage with that team so they can go and understand the why. Like, So what, what are you trying to solve? What's the job to be done? It may be that that person has negative connotations with the tool that's already there. It may be that they're just unaware that it's even there. But it may be that that tool doesn't provide the solution that they're looking for. So by centralizing it, that team can then engage with them and then work out, okay, which one of those three is it? If it's we don't have that tool, then that's a great thing because they're learning about maybe an emerging tool that they might not be aware of that they can go and explore and experiment. But also mm-hmm. what that team allows you to do is control the volume. So rather than ending up with 400 tools that don't talk to each other, they'll maybe look at right, where does that tool fit in and on the graduation framework, what do we want to offboard? Or maybe we don't want to offboard a tool, how does that fit in? And then also, what? how do we drive the adoption of that tool? Because I think that's something that's totally underestimated is people bring in tools and just expect people to understand how to use them. And a lot of people are digitally native or um, they're reliant on, on digital technologies. But I think the one thing that organizations don't do very well is um, on, to help people understand how those tools make them more efficient and effective, but also reduce feelings of stress. Mm-hmm. So any person I talk to in a company about Slack or Teams or 
the first thing they do is, oh my God, like uh, it drives me insane. It's a conveyor belt of information. Now, one or two things hasn't happened. They're, they've not structured it in the right way in terms of educating people on naming conventions, the protocols of when to at mention, when not to at mention. But more importantly, they've not educated people on just some of the tips and hints of how do I save for later? Or where do I go to see what's relevant to me so I'm not having to consume everything? Like how do I develop focus time in my calendars? These fundamental things that are really important. So it's a big topic. I think starting with identifying what are the things you're trying to achieve, what are the jobs to be done is a great starting point. And then looking at the tools, but also considering that wider uh, employee experience is really, really important. Um, one of the platforms we built for three um, was we built a platform where people could get one source to go and get their news, their guidance and their tools and systems. And it was mm -hmm. all personalized to them. So if you worked in retail or if you worked in digital or if you worked in uh, finance, you had a personalized experience of it. It would, it would, it would uh, surface the tools that were relevant to you. It would surface information that's relevant to you and the news as well. But it gave that single source of truth. And we were able to index the search in a really powerful way that we could connect it to other legacy systems that were already there. So Oracle's, some LMS systems, systems that are horrible. They've got a terrible user experience and people only go there for mandatory training. But if you can surface it through one location, mm -hmm. you're making it a lot easier for people to find that information and therefore save them time. So yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge piece, uh, the digital tools and infrastructure piece. Yeah. Um, but it's... It is solvable. Like I've done it inside a, a large incumbent with like twelve and a half thousand people, so it is possible in startups. You're at a massive advantage, aren't you? Because uh, the greenfield aspect of it. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a very good insight. And Frank is speaking. And speaking about the starting point, probably my my last question would be: What the what are the top three considerations you would recommend for entrepreneurs, executives who are kind of new to this remote work environments, right? Global hiring environments. Uh, what what might be your top three uh, advice here, pieces of advice here? Yeah, so I think um, the three of them touch upon some of the elements we've spoken about already. So number one is, is fostering that culture of trust. Mm -hmm. um, I think like we said earlier, without it, it doesn't work. So I think yeah. you can do that and executives can do that by communicating openly, making it a regular thing, but also like we touched on, making sure there's clear alignment on the tasks and the outcomes and how they align to the, the broader purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and also giving your talented people the autonomy to go and figure things out. So the simple thing is trusting people to do their job. I am um, to that last question that you asked, I think invest in that digital employee experience. Um, make it easy for people to find information and tools to get their job done. And they don't have to be reliant on syncing up with people or interrupting people to find mm -hmm. that information. That's really underestimated. And um, making sure you've got uh, the right information architecture around that, you make sure that you're constantly evolving that and it's very clean and, and always up to date. Um, because like I said earlier, lots of people think it's just tools, but the tool is not the goal. So. Uh, that single source of truth is really important. And then the last one is, I think it's just investing in in-person. Like I, I do think building that connection, like we touched on, putting in the, the virtual aspects that we spoke of. But I think if you can invest in in-person, then try to do that with retreats, um, build connection, build community, align on the purpose and the vision. Um, I think that's really, really important. Um, yeah, those are, those are probably the top three. Okay. Okay, sounds good. Okay, Gary. So thanks a lot for for sharing your insights. Thanks for 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 your time. We appreciate that very much. Thank you for uh, sharing information about this myth of remote work, about this remote work culture, about digital tools. Uh, so yeah, it was great. We wish you and your kind of initiatives all the best in your journey. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Absolutely.